Welcome to the Z Sleep Club webinar. Today's topic, Good to Sleep Go Comes to North America with John Bozes. Little reminder, if we're having a Z Sleep Club study club meeting, members will be sent a join link. If we're having a Z Sleep Club webinar, members will be sent a registration link that they need to register in order to get the join link. New for 2024, our 65-hour coverage of dental sleep medicine. Everything you need to know to become involved at the highest proficiency. This is done over six sessions, hybrid, online asynchronous learning, and hands-on in-class learning. Until December 31st, there's a 10% coupon, save 10 early bird, that can be used to bring the tuition down by 10%. A little bit of housekeeping. If you want to toggle to get a full screen of the slide you're watching, you need to hit the three buttons on the upper right corner and it will uh, hit toggle full screen. You have to pick your computer or phone audio and you can put your questions in the chat box. CE certificates will be emailed within a couple of weeks. And for AGD CE, it is very important that you provide the required information at the end of um, the webinar, which will be asked during the closing questions. This is mandatory in order to prove that you've been attending and it's required by AGD. So, good to sleep go. Is it a software platform? Is it a patient app? Is it a marketing tool? It is a, a calibration tool. Is it a monitoring tool? Well, Dr. John Bozes became very intrigued when he heard about this company, and I'm really excited to hear, along with the rest of you, what it brings to the table for us that are involved in dental sleep medicine. And with that, I'll hand the platform over to Dr. John Bozes. Thank you, John, for the opportunity to present. I, uh, at the end of this, of course, there'll be a question and answer period that I'll go ahead and, and stay on for and clean up any mistakes that I made throughout the process or any questions that you might have. And with that being said, let's get started. So perhaps in February, you'll be joining your peers either at the NADSM or the TDS Symposium, where you'll be suffering the pain of change rather than remaining the way you are. If necessity is the mother of invention, discontent has to be the father of progress. Change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of the change itself. Briefly, a dental sleep medicine timeline. To start with what I term the polysomnogram era, where we would place neural appliance, advance the patient to subjective symptoms, then return the patient to their physician for a polysomnogram one-night study while hoping for a good night of sleep accompanied by efficacious data. The outcome being either a lucky night of data that may or may not be accurate due to the variability of sleep followed by continually chasing efficacy within the context of sleep variability. And quite often, with severe range patients, we would be told that the patient needed to go back on PAP even if their AHI was, say, as low as 7. Then we entered the HST era, where things really didn't change very much. We were still typically looking at a one-night study, we would place the oral appliance, advance the subjective symptoms, send the patient back to the physician for a single night HST, and we were already well schooled at hoping, but at this stage we blame more the appliance or the variability in the testing device itself, even though all we could do was suspect the variability of sleep, which quite frankly often gave us a better result than we sometimes deserved. Then we next entered what I call the overnight oximetry and HST era, and Ono offered somewhat more reliability prior to sending the patient back to their MD for an HST, 
especially if we used a high-resolution pulse ox like the SAT screen, which gives us an RDI, as well as multiple lines of data. And then we moved on to the HST battle, where dentistry began quibbling over where HSTs could be used mostly diagnostically for dentists, when really this is a medical problem. We might have been better served if the, our cause was for the variability of sleep or for the need of calibration. And then the night owl era. If nothing else, the night owl era allowed us to eliminate the device variability by gathering two nights of data prior to delivery. But its real value was forcing the industry to acknowledge the elephant in the room of the variability of sleep, which a self-adjusting PAP device continues to allow the medical community to largely turn a blind eye to, which we can't when providing oral plants therapy. Then we enter today where we have Good Sleep Co. and the Sleep Image Ring. And the Sleep Image Ring has been around a bit. Good Sleep Co. is getting ready to launch here in North America. Once therapy has been agreed upon, you can provide the patient a Sleep Image Ring and begin the collection of data continually nightly throughout the getting used to and the calibration phase to efficacy. If the patient is in the severe range, you may even choose to start calibration sooner rather than later. Another value of this is that you can also use this process to monitor and or check those patients that are on PAP. So as Good Sleep Co. begins to launch in North America, we're going to have one of their co-founders, Joel Simpson, at the NADSM, and the other, Greg Goodman, at the Transform Dental Sleep Symposium in Scottsdale. A bit about Joel. Joel is one of the founding directors at Good Sleep Co., bringing 12 years of experience in the sleep apnea and snoring treatment market across multiple disciplines to the development of their products. Specifically, he leads the development of digital assets and tools that assist patients and practitioners in their treatment journey. He is passionate about improving connected health options in the sleep apnea space and helping to position Good Sleep Co. as a market leader. He was also the previous director and founder of Rise Sleep Health, based in Southeast Queensland, and has worked in the technologically medical device sector for sleep apnea for eight years, building effective sleep apnea treatment brands while assisting companies achieve success in the field. Again, Joel will be at the NADSM. His partner and co-founder, Greg Goodman, is also one of the founding directors of Good Sleep Co. and transfers his 20 years of experience in the healthcare industry to bring Good Sleep Co. products to life. He works with key partners, including multinational businesses and corporate clinic groups to improve access to Good Sleep products. As an integral leader of the design team, Greg maintains a strong focus on the patient experience throughout the treatment life cycles as a highly experienced managing director with over 20 years in the dental industry. He holds a Bachelor of Accounting degree and an MBA, which would make him a valuable asset to any organization. Throughout his career, Greg has demonstrated a strong ability to establish and grow successful businesses. He is a firm believer in the importance of strong customer relationships, and this ethos is evident in the way he leads and manages his teams. He understands that a company's success is built on the satisfaction of its customers, and he's committed to going the extra mile to ensure that each client is completely satisfied with the products and the services they provide. So just as in golf, where what happens after you strike the ball is far more important than which ball you actually use. So is it in dental sleep medicine, where the protocol you use after delivering the appliance is probably more significant than the appliance itself. So in this voiceover by John Bibiano, we're gonna talk about something big that's coming. Yeah. 
a web application for health professionals, a patient-facing app, unparalleled real-time support for sleep patient monitoring and progress, remotely monitor and treat your sleep patients, allow patients to easily track their progress, they can use the sleep image ring, as well as subjectively record daily snoring and energy levels. Sleep reports are then available to the patient and practitioner. And the best news of all, monitor progress for the appliance of your choice. So that's a very significant point, is that you're going to be able to not change what you're doing clinically, yet you'll be able to use their process to better diagnostically look at data during the titration phase, but also the monitoring phase. And you can get a report on your on your computer in your office with respect to that happening, as well as the patient having one on the phone. So first, more on why and how dental sleep medicine resembles golf. If we look at these golf swings, first, Arnold Palmer, if you look at kind of the violence at the top of his swing, and that's very uncharacteristic for any other golfer throughout decades. Yet, Arnold Palmer won seven majors and 62 tournaments. And then Jack Nicklaus. He clearly never kept his head down throughout his entire career. And yet Jack won 18 majors and 117 tournaments. And then Lee Torino who lined up one way and hit the ball the other. And Lee won six majors and 29 tournaments. Gary Player, with his famous walkthrough, where he would strike the ball and then take a step down the fairway. Gary Player won nine majors and 165 tournaments. And then, of course, probably one of the most famous golfers of the modern era, anyway, Tiger Woods, with 15 majors and 82 tournament wins. So as demonstrated, a four inch in front swing bottom is all that really matters to be successful. And how you get there actually makes this difference than one might imagine. And I think the same is true in dental sleep medicine. Which appliance you use is less important than what you actually do with it. So if you look at these three golf swings with very different swing styles, all were masters of ball contact. And as demonstrated by Bobby Clampett in his research and work, the only important ingredient that really matters in good golf is the impact zone and how you actually contact the golf ball. But just like in dental sleep medicine, some lies or cases are teed up, while some contain buried and hidden obstacles that present ongoing challenges. Needless to say, it's what you do with the appliance that matters most. So some things that are simply not as they appear to be. Occasionally, the only thing that can be relied upon is that things are not what they appear to be. Allow me to provide an example. This is not what it appears to be at first glance. This is a tree. In a review of articles, Hofstein in 2007 stated, examination of the individual investigations reveals that when oral compliances are compared to each other, either two different appliances or the same appliance with different degrees of protrusion or opening, it is clear that the efficacy, objective and subjective, is very much dependent on the type of appliance and the degree of advancement. There is no best appliance. The best one is that which is comfortable to the patient and achieves the desired efficacy. Gazal, in 2009, compared a Herbst appliance to a TAP and found similar objective efficacy, but better subjective efficacy with the TAP at six months. This difference had disappeared at a second evaluation two years later, 
However, it also showed that 26% of the patients using the HERPS device and 42% of the TAP patients had actually discontinued their treatment. Based on these results, more patients might have preferred the HERPS to plants in the long run. They also concluded, it is currently impossible to recommend a specific type of mandibular advancement appliance when considering long-term results. Focusing upon short-term results, the IST seemed to be inferior to the TAP and the OSA model block devices. As long as the mandible is advanced continuously during sleep, with an appliance, and during the treatment period, appliance characteristics that enhance comfort during wear, and the greater durability of its material should be prioritized. Now, this is in no way meant to be a review of the literature. But to be clear, every appliance has its advantages and disadvantages, and quite honestly, some are better than others. But what you do with the appliance, just like golf, if you can reach the sweet spot of efficacy, that most likely makes more difference than the appliance itself. And for me, I prefer a thermoplastic liner and an anterior midpoint stop, and you may not care for either. So now we're going to look at some data. We're going to look at some data with the sleep image ring, the circle ring, and the night owl. This is 21 nights of data, and we're going to Strip this down a little bit to make it a little easier to look at. First, we're going to look at the SpO2 values. And this is the mean SpO2 on the sleep image ring and the average SpO2 on the circle. I know they're calculated a little different, but at first glance, you can see the variability of sleep. And if you look a little closer, these devices aren't really off that much from each other, but about a point or two, probably clinically insignificant with respect to the values that they report. So the variability of sleep is a much bigger problem than the variability in the devices. If we look at the AHI on the sleep image ring and the ODI on the circle, which are not comparable measurements by any means, but again, you can see the variability of sleep. And if we just look at the AHI, which is what our industry currently is doing, we have a variation from a high AHI of 11.65 down to 3.3. And this data is reported on the sleep care app that the patient has and also on the resident application that the provider has in the office. And again, just look at the variability of sleep. Now, one might think that that's diagnostic data, but actually it's not. This is actually wearing therapy as reported on the sleep care application. So most of us would not think that an oral appliance had capability of adjusting to this variability of sleep. As a matter of fact, we might think that we want to set the appliance at the point of the most severe night, and that would cover the other nights. That would probably also increase the possibility of side effects. Most of us would probably think that wearing an auto pap that's self-adjusted would pretty much take care of this variable. Most of us would be shocked to know that this data was actually collected while on pap and an oral appliance and lip tape at the same time every night, all night, yet look at the sleep variability. One might correctly or incorrectly assume it's the testing device but it could also be position or a variety of other factors. So let's look at some data off what some people will call the gold standard, the AutoPAP. This is a ResMed AirSense 10. And there's a lot of data on this, so let's strip it down to just the AHI and the pressure. And you can see the AHI varies a little bit from night to night, and you can see the pressure changes that are occurring. This data is over the same nights of data that, that I previously showed you. So I think really regarding data, the reality is that 
there not only exists a substantial variability of sleep from night to night, but also from device to device. This simply is not a perfectly measurable science, as the medical community might like to believe regarding their treatment of choice, PAP, or the dental community, for that matter, might like to believe of theirs, mandibular advancement devices. Let's now take a look at some data that just involves AHI. This is from the sleep image ring at 3% and the night owl at 3%. So now we're actually at least looking at data that is calculated with the same parameters. And still, look at the variability, not only from night to night, but also from device to device. Clearly, the sleep image ring reports a little bit higher AHI than the night owl does. Both of them have variability. Probably variability of sleep rather than the device. So my point here is that the more data we have, the better decisions we can make for patients. We also, and we're all too aware, that we have a patient and physician awareness problem. Both John Viviano, Barry Glassman, and Dom Alizia live in a world of evidence-based literature and teachings. I live in a world of what-ifs, why-nots, and possibilities based on research. Believing that what we are doing works for no one not the patients coming to us for care, and certainly not the providers delivering the care itself. As primarily a product and device-driven industry continues making money off those not making any money. Small wonder, 70% of dentists don't screen their own patients. More on that later. A healthcare system where the provider wants more for the patient than they want for themselves is simply not sustainable because at some point one or the other loses their gratitude and simply walks away. Even though sleep disturbed breathing is the most frequent non-communicable disease in the Western world, sleep apnea has an awareness problem amongst physicians, patients, and dentists. The day must arrive when patients are so aware of the dangers of OSA and their quality of life issues that they will self-advocate. But when will our professional organizations begin to advocate for this awareness? And when will dental sleep medicine reach a point where we as providers demand it and put a stop to reaching out for products and devices as if that and that alone is going to solve the problem? We have the research. We know that's not the issue. So this awareness problem for physicians, dentists, and patients alike has left dental sleep medicine with certainly a perfect storm. In April 2021, a dental town survey reported 70% of dental practices don't screen for OSA, and that problem continues. This creates a problem going forward, as the ADA suggests what needs to be done and the providers themselves want nothing to do with it. The problem statistically, 70% of dental practices choose not to screen, and 32% report no interest at all in learning to do so. Further thoughts. Although it is reported on Dental Town that 70% of practices do not screen their patients, it may be a realistic assumption that this number is considerably higher when including those that do not visit information sites such as Dental Town with any regularity, which, if true, would then also make the report that 30% do screen their patients highly inflated. Also, with 18% of the dentists on Dental Town self reporting that they already offer sleep apnea in their practices, this number may as well be misleading depending on how one defines. Sleep therapy. Rationale. A prominent Canadian sleep lab reported that 20%, or 179 of their clients, ordered mandibular advancement devices in 2019. Seven prescribed 10 or more, while 99 prescribed two or less. Gladwell. In 2019, the largest OSA, OAT provider in the U.S., reported 20%, of their clients treated OSA and snoring, with less than 1% of 
ordering more than 10 devices. When asked what the biggest obstacle was in adding sleep to their practice, dentists reported 47% billing and insurance. So the problem statistically from 2022 to 2023. Just briefly, we're going to look at these highlighted areas. When asked, is dentistry doing a great job? In 2022, 21% said they were. In 2023, that dropped 10 points to 11. When asked what their role should be, should it be to only screen and refer? In 2022, 28% said it should be to screen and refer. Whereas in 2023, that jumped 12 points to 40%. When asked if they already delivered sleep care, in 2022, 24% of the dentists said they did, while in 2023, that dropped 6 point to 18. So a possible interpretation here could be that the dental community is becoming more and more aware, and that awareness is that maybe they themselves only thought that they delivered sleep care. And in reality, not only they are not doing so, they really have chosen to pass it on to someone else. We need a new why, a new model. It's approached in nearly eight years now since the ADA's 2015 to around 2017 paper, and yet there has really been no significant change. Imagine the number of new appliances, KOL lectures, testing devices, and business models that have emerged in the last eight years, some due to COVID, and yet we still today quibble over the near same 20% of the diagnosed, and that number for dentistry remains even smaller than that, as PAP, whether it is appropriate or not, is the most often prescribed form of therapy. Now let's collect some dots regarding social media marketing. From June to mid-November 2023, I have spent north of $8,000 and not made one appliance resulting from this campaign, while making the assumption that patients were seeking oral appliance therapy or even knew about oral appliances. A model to address the problem moving forward. A change in the landscape of sleep for patients and providers alike. Along with removing barriers, we need to rethink measuring, reporting, record-keeping, and monitoring. We need a new why. I have a 14-page proposal made to the Wyoming State Dental Regulatory Board suggesting guidelines for screening and treating or screening and referring the patients coming to us for care. Anybody that wants a copy of this, just reach out to me and I'm happy to provide it to you. Dr. Viviano has been doing something similar up in Canada as the province he lives in, Ontario, is one of the provinces up there that does not have full guidance um, implemented by their regulatory board, the RCDSO. Both Dr. Viviano and myself have made these presentations to our regulatory board, and at least at this point in time, they have both chosen to not move forward. InSteps Good Sleep Co. It's a software and an app company. We've discussed it a bit. The Sleep Care app is the patient's app on their phone. The resident app is in the dental provider's office, and we can look at data every morning that the patient has collected through wearing the sleep imagery at night. Your mission overview is to create innovative products to change the user experience, to create best-in-class tools for practitioners. In detail, they want to build first to be first to market and best-in-class digital products. They want to improve patient access. They will market direct to consumer. So by the time we market direct to the consumer, what are we going to be doing there? We're going to be increasing awareness. They want to educate dentists, of course, which needs to be done. We need to know how to provide the care. And they want to change consumer narratives on therapy options and improve their willingness to undergo diagnostic sleep studies. They want to reduce overall chair time for dentists. 
make smaller, stronger, and more comfortable oral appliances because they also manufacture oral appliances. And they want to provide ongoing remote monitoring. And like I've already mentioned, you can do that for your oral appliances and also for patients on PAP. They'll surprise They'll, they'll supply superior practitioner submission for digital scans and a much better patient experience. They offer a hushed trial appliance, which is a boil appliance. The interesting thing there is now you can have a trial appliance that you can also um, look at the efficacy of through the sleep image ring, and the app itself coaches the patient on the advancement of it based on that data. They make a hushed Avera, which is simpler, so similar to the Prosomnus IA. A hushed Pro Auto, which their propulsion methods there are through elastics. And they also make a Bruxism appliance. The initial trial or snoring appliance, when you can look at it along with the AHA and uh, AHI, and the patient can monitor that as well, is really got the potential to engage the patient in their in their health in the process. It just may make the patient so aware that they seek our care, especially that we can look at the data. Not particularly in favor of, of uh, trial appliances for everybody, but you know, if the patients are going to do this anyway, I, I mean, why not? Uh, Good Sleep Co. is talking about the possibility of getting these for sale on Amazon, uh, Maybe, you know, places like Walgreens and, and, and that. And boy, if they can do that, just the awareness they're going to create is, is, is big. And then, of course, right through the app, they can refer the patients to a dental provider. So the sleep monitor in the app works with any appliance. That's the key point. Okay. It doesn't have to be their trial appliance. It doesn't have to be one of their, they're, they're printed appliances. And you can download the app here. I'll leave that up at the, uh, uh, at the question period here in the presentation. So to kind of look at this with a little bit, uh, kind of an overview, they've been working on this for the last two or three years. This is the resident app the application that the provider will have. This is a sleep care app that the patient will have. It's unparalleled real-time support for patient monitoring. And it allows patients to easily track their progress. And it even coaches them through the advancement. They can use the sleep image ring put in subjective data, which provides a score. And the sleep reports are then available to both the patient and the practitioner. There's, there's not a lot of devices other than PAP that do this. There's patient alerts and reminders. There's a wake time and reminders to use their AM aligner, as well as some advice on how to clean the device. You get to work more closely with your patient. You're on the same team. Get to see the titration data from the sleep care and within resident. The app's ingrained with tools that support sleep patients. It guides the patient how to titrate and when. There's exercises to help reduce side effects. Patients can book an appointment with clinics directly in the sleep care app. And then they're referred to the dentist. Patients can make appointments with a sleep coach, which will help guide them through the process. Information on warranties is housed in the apps, as well as cleaners, and how to order them. And really, the big thing is efficacy and compliance monitoring. You get AHI, SPO2 values, and a score. And you can also monitor PAP. Okay, that, that's big because you can take a dental practice that can simply hand the patient a sleep image ring just to check their pap. Be surprised what that's going to tell you 
about compliance and also how it's going to open channels of communication with the patient that perhaps previously in a dental practice proved to be rather awkward. So be sure to visit with co-founders Joel Simpson at the NADSM meeting or Greg Goodman at the TDS meeting booth, February 2nd and 3rd, 2024. What's good about Good Sleep Co? The good news is the Good Sleep Co offers great appliances. The better news is you can use whatever appliance you wish and still benefit from their application. Once several nights of study demonstrates as much consistency as the variability of sleep will allow, for example, in this situation, October 7th, 8th, and 9th, then you can actually order a sleep study through the app. You'll get notification of this. Hello, John Boses. A new sleep report is available for John Boses. View reports, regards. Now, actually, that appears that way because I'm performing both as a patient and the provider. You'll get a, an interpretation summary and procedural technical summary, a report summary along with a detailed report and a histogram. We'll show more of that here in a moment. So I took and compared some data with the sleep image ring and the circle. I like the circle because I've, I've, I've looked at multiple nights of data with the circle compared to the SAT screen, and it's a pretty reliable device. Uh, if we look at the ODI on the sleep image ring, it's reported as 3.7. On the same night on the circle, it's 3.5. If we look at the nadir on the sleep image ring, it's 88. On the circle, it's 87.9. If we look at the mean SpO2 value on the sleep image ring, and if we look at the average, again, I know they're calculated differently, they're 93 and 93.7. So those are certainly in the ballpark. So you could use either device to help monitor and, and I, I think we'd be comfortable with it. But I think you can also see the advantages to the good sleep code process. The variability of sleep is here to stay. Here I took 10 nights of data. I stripped out the high and low and reduced it to 8. And the average AHI was at 3%, was 8.045 with all 10 days and 7.86625. With the high and low removed. And essentially, what I'm trying to say here is the point being is that upon taking into account larger amounts of data than just a single night, your treatment decisions and guidance for the patient will simply be more accurate. I know there are those that suggest that they don't want the patient to be looking at data, but me personally, I'd rather partner with the patient in the same cause than trying to be tell them what to do when they don't want to. This is an interesting bit of data here too. I've always liked the SAT screen. Um, had a local sleep physician wear it for a week himself. Um, he, he approved and liked it. And the RDI is very close to the AHI. So here we are looking at the AHI on the sleep image ring, just for three nights of data, and the RDI on the SAT screen high resolution pulse oximeter. And you can see the AHI over three nights is 5.87, 5.63, 4.06. The RDI is 5, 4, and 4. So, you know, either of those devices are, are, are very good. The SAT screen, you just have to have the patient return to the office so you can download the data. The interesting thing, the SPO2 values on the sleep image ring versus the SAT screen are identical. 94, 94, 95, 95, 94, and 94. On the circle, they vary a little bit, but once again, I don't think it would change your clinical decision. ODI on the SAT screen and ODI on the circle, they're obviously a little different. Needless to say, I trust the SAT screen with respect to that more, but the circle is certainly a reliable device as well. This is the uh, report that you get, so you get patient details. You can scroll down, the patient can scroll down this on their, uh, their phone app, and you can see just night after night of data. This is what the report itself looks like. 
So you get a procedural and technical summary, like I mentioned. You get a report summary, which includes apnea apopnic index, both obstructive and central. You get a detailed report that also contains SpO2 values, uh, WASO uh, information on rest, on REM sleep, sleep efficiency, sleep latency, and then of course you get the histogram. So the Good Sleep Co. workflow and patient experience. The marketing component of it, the marketing arm of it. I think more patients come to a dental practice because of snoring rather than coming in saying that they have OSA, unless they've already been diagnosed. So with the trial of plants with the sleep monitoring device, the sleep image ring, and the coaching, I believe that you're going to engage the patient, make them more aware, bring them onto your team, and they're going to be looking at the data and so are you, which makes it easier to guide them further through the process. You can order diagnostic testing right through the app, and that testing can be reported with either an AI report or with a physician interpretation. I believe that the cost of the AI report is $30 US dollars. And I believe the cost of the test with an interpretation is right around the $100 mark. And like I've mentioned, whether the patient is on PAP or whether they're on oral appliance, you can use the same device to monitor the efficacy of it. You'd be surprised what you'll find. You start monitoring patients on PAP. to monitor both forms of therapy and get a report on your desk. I mean, that really puts us on par, hopefully in physicians' eyes, with PAP. The other particularly interesting thing is that Good Sleep Co. has partnered with Virtuox. And it goes without being said that Virtuox has a rather large footprint. I'm unable to say that I, I'm fully aware of what kind of relationship Good Sleep Co. has with Virtuox. Um, I don't know what business relationship they have. But imagine something like this. At least in my community, if a primary care physician orders uh, overnight oximetry, or an HST for that matter, through a local DME, it's typically going to be Virtuox doing the testing. I mean, that's the reports I see. Imagine if Virtuox kind of maneuvered or helped the local DMEs for those patients that failed PAP, if they just managed to help guide those patients on to a good sleep co-dentist. Um, I don't know that you could get the DMEs to do that, but something of that nature would certainly be good for patients. So the fact that they are, they're involved with Virtuox, I think is going to be a good thing for everybody involved. So in summary, essentially, it is my belief that there are few things in this very broken system that can't be made better by a super aware and motivated patient. Once real consumer value is created for what we as dentists can bring to the table for this population of patients, both our medical and dental colleagues will be left with little choice but to step up to the plate and provide collaborative care. Although the payers, even if they choose to initially offer coverage to better position themselves, among other insurance carriers, will most likely at some stage further employ their typical delay and deny posture as they tend to their own bottom line. The good, or maybe great news might be, that they will be left with a patient that then self-purchases what we have to offer, as we find ourselves better able to provide their care at a lesser fee, once third parties serving their own needs have removed themselves from the process as well as from the patient's expectations, which might then allow the volume of what we do to drive the cost of delivery and care down, clean up some of the work that has to be done in order to get the work done, while actually then encouraging more dentists to become involved. Until we find a way to reach out to that 
80% that are undiagnosed and those 70% of dentists that are not screening their patients, I really don't see much of a way that we're going to make a change in, in what we're presently doing. I don't know for sure that what I've described here is the solution to the problem, but I think I can state with confidence that I am sure that what we're doing now doesn't work. I think because of that, we need to look to other things. I'll remain on here and answer some questions. Um, Joel, again, will be at the NADSM. Greg will be at the TDSM in, um, in Scottsdale. I want to thank Dr. John Viviano and the STD Academy for allowing me to present this. And of course, Joel and Craig, they've been a pleasure to work with. Well, great. That was fantastic, Dr. Boltz. Really enjoyed that. Uh, let me ask you, how did you come to discover Good Sleep Go? Well, actually, I was, I was asked by Virtuox if I would give some of their appliance offerings a try, which I have. I, I agreed to. And I found myself thinking that their process would maybe more than likely enhance what we are doing in dental sleep medicine, perhaps improve our position in the eyes of the medical colleagues, and maybe even bring more dentists to the table. So it was through Virtuox. I see. Interesting. You know, it's interesting that ortho costs more than treating OSA, yet patients say yes to ortho and no to oral appliance therapy on a regular basis, regardless of whether there's insurance coverage or not. It's, it's, do you think this product can help better educate patients and help them understand the value of, of proceeding with therapy? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Actually, actually, I do. Um, you, you know, I think with respect to orthodontics and versus sleep, I think people view orthodontics as a something they want, and when they're in a dental practice, sometimes they view sleep as something we're trying to sell them. And even though that's not the case, um, but it certainly seems that way. And because people buy what they want not necessarily what they need. Um, I think that's why orthodontics, with it being kind of a self-esteem thing, is, is looked at that way with patients. Um, it is also my belief that awareness, which Good Sleep Co. would definitely help patients be more aware. Um, it would help them understand the risks better, uh, the quality of life issues, and I think that it would help us get more of the undiagnosed diagnosed and more patients in treatment. So I definitely think the answer to that question is yes, absolutely it would. So it's a good communication a communication tool for, uh, with patients. Yeah, and a lot of that takes place without the dental or the well that without the dentist or the dental office having to be involved. So it takes place in the background through their sleep care app. It, it engages the patient and brings them on to the team. Dentists often think of an oral appliance as uh, simply another profit center in their practice. Um, do you, you think your typical dentist um, is able to communicate the problem, the ramifications of the problem not being managed and leaving it untreated as adequately as, as, as they, they should? And do you think this app um, and, and this software uh, can help with the aid in that process? Oh, that's, that's a really good question, too. Uh, I think for the most part, when a dentist does look at, and I think most of them do, they look at things they want to bring into the practice as a profit center only, then they really do not have the skills to have the conversations with the patients or, or the time or, or the patients to have the conversations with them. So therefore, if, you, if you're dealing with an unaware patient and a provider that really is just looking at this as a profit center, which is, is important for business, but it just doesn't help move the patient into the funnel very easily. So yeah, I, I think Good, Good Sleep Co. really kind of fills that gap. And it will also bring the provider closer to the patient as well as the patient closer to the provider as far as their understanding of this problem. Does that make sense? 
It does, John. What about uh, patient awareness? I mean, you know, MDs often only talk about CPAP as an option, and um, you know, patients need to be advised of, of an oral appliance option otherwise. Unfortunately, not all dentists are, are doing the job of educating patients as to the oral appliance option. So they hear about it from a friend or you know, what some other source. So the question is, is uh, Good Sleep Co. Uh, bring any value to the table there with regards to um, uh, making patients aware of the oral appliance option? Yes, I think I think their approach, even though it's it's a, a mission in progress, um, you know, they offer a trial appliance, which is they they intend on getting uh, marketed on Amazon and other platforms. That is going to have an opportunity to at least introduce the public uh, to that information. Probably most patients would be looking for a snoring solution with respect to that. But then um, once they do have the app, because they, they have the availability to get the app once they get the, the trial appliance, but they can use any appliance. Uh, then they're guided through the data, the AHI that is actually on their phone. The app makes suggestions as to how they should advance that appliance. And then it is also making suggestions that the patient consider moving forward to a more definitive form of therapy or a custom fabricated oral appliance. So there, there's a process that they take the patient through. And I, I've seen it myself. I have one patient doing it now as a trial, and I've, I've found that to be effective. So these next two questions are somewhat interrelated, so I'll ask them together. I'll just read them the way they came in. An issue that doesn't get much attention is that as more dentists end up practicing in dental service corporations, they aren't looking at the health benefit to patients. They have a private equity and venture capitalist to keep happy. Uh, they like Invisalign. Uh, and, and the second question is I have approached a uh, quite a few dentists about treating sleep in their private practice, and they are worried that it will attract undue attention to their practice. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the second question means, but perhaps you could shed some light on that. Yeah, I think I think what these two questions involve is the they they sort of come from I believe the thinking that the 70% of the dentist don't screen their patients, and, and, and why is that? Um, and I think they can't find a way to squeeze it into their practice. They can't make it a profit center uh, because there's a lot of moving parts to it. And I, I think more than anything, it's an indication that where medicine is, dentistry is headed. And by that, I mean the DSO corporations are guiding the patients or the, the providers and structuring them as to what services they want them to provide and, and that I'm not a member of a DSO. But my takeaway from these questions is that the DSO does not want their DSO corporation dentist to be doing sleep because it's it's just too complex. Uh, they don't have the soft skills, the communication skills to make that work. And and therefore um, they they really don't uh, want the dental practice to be doing that. The dentist doesn't want to do it either for the same reason 70% of the dentists in the country don't now. I, I believe that awareness solved this problem or helps this problem anyway, because any awareness that's created, regardless of how that's done, it's going to take and make the patient bring it up. So now the patient is going to ask the dental provider, whether they're a DSO dentist or not, if they provide this service, and if the dental office chooses not to, if because they're a DSO corporated dentist, then at least the patient will ask them for a referral to a dentist that will be able to do that. And I think we're going to need an aware patient uh, uh, because as uh, fees are continuing to, reimbursements are continuing to go down, costs are continuing to go up, we're going to be approaching the patient's uh, population that's going to have to be able to uh, 
probably consider spending more out of pocket. There, everything's not going to be covered. So I, I, I don't know if that answers the question in the manner that, that is understandable to you. Um, is there anything else pertaining to that that, that you can think of? Um, no, maybe just review again how you feel that good sleep goal can increase patient awareness. Again, it's just the um, – everybody has a cell phone these days. And we seem to – I mean, if you go out to dinner and there's five people sitting at the table across from you, all five of them have their cell phone on, and none of them are talking to each other. So if it's the world we live in, and this Good Sleep Co. app is absolutely geared towards addressing the awareness issue with patients because they, they're not able to market their product without that. Um, and you could download the app with the, uh, by uh, clicking the QR code that's, that's uh, on the screen here and see for yourself. Um, but it, it just is engaging to the patient. And I, I can't describe it any better than that without you actually seeing it for yourself. Uh, it doesn't even feel educational, though. Uh, it just feels engaging is what it does. Uh, in other words, it doesn't bring up PDF files. It doesn't talk about technical stuff like ODIs and HIs and stuff like that. Um, it just it just really talks about quality of life things. And I, I really can't describe it any better than that without you experiencing it. So I would encourage you to do something. How is your typical patient going to get exposed to this app to even see what it brings to the table? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, if we can go back to the trial of plants again, which is titratable, um, I would picture perhaps a new dental practice that doesn't do sleep, but they're looking at it from a profit center point of view, okay, which would be likely. They could take and uh, have a very short, or their hygienist could have a very short conversation regarding snoring, or have a few questions on their healthcare history that open the conversation with respect to uh, snoring and sleep disorder breathing issues. And then they could provide a patient right out of their office a temporary appliance, which is not to say that I make a lot of temporary appliances because I don't. But um, a new office could then provide that patient a, a temporary appliance. The cost uh, to the practice is somewhere around $60, $65. That gives the patient access to the app. Um, then the, they could also purchase or the dentist could hand the patient a sleep image ring. So now they could be looking at data off that. So I, I just think it's a, it's a, a doorway, a gateway to bring up the conversation that most dental practices find kind of awkward. Um, so I think, I think that's one thing. The other thing is, is Good Sleep Co. intends on doing some marketing to communities. And then when those patients do find their, their uh, uh, temporary appliance or the app or, or they're looking at data, then those patients will be forwarded or guided towards uh, a provider that has the resident app, which also has the data. And then, of course, along the way, you're going to end up with a, with a patient that can set appointments with a sleep coach that uh, Good Sleep Co. has, and they're going to be guided in that direction. They're not going to answer a lot of technical questions, but they're going to be responsive to what the patient, what they perceive the patient's wants and needs are, and then they're going to guide the patient appropriately. Um, it's just something you're going to have to experience to, to, to form your own opinion on. Regarding the sleep coach, what qualifications do they have? Because at present, it's pretty unregulated as a field, and many learning programs are composed of only one to two hours with little experience for them. So um, but what type of uh, um, qualifications for the sleep coaches associated with uh, Good Sleep Co. have? That's an interesting question, too. And I, I think they are going to want to be careful to not be providing diagnostic type information 
uh, over over a phone. So basically, it's going to be guidance through the system, uh, answering questions for patients. So so a patient may uh, maybe they have a trial of plants, maybe they have the the sleep care app, they set an appointment with a sleep coach, and maybe their question is, how do I get tested? How how can I get diagnostically tested? And the sleep coach would be perfectly capable of answering those questions and or referring the the patient then to a, a dentist that has their resident app uh, application. Uh, so they're going to be pretty much guiding the patient and not trying to fill the gap of a provider. Makes total sense. Now, ADA, their policy, the AADSM and their efforts, I mean, nothing's moved the needle with regards to getting more dentists involved in this. What do you think um, good sleep code brings to the table here that will result in a different outcome? Yeah, I'm, you know, what I'm, what I'm hoping and what I think can occur, although it will be a slow moving ship to get to this point is we are simply dealing with an, an awareness problem in this field. Uh, we have an awareness problem with providers, medical and dental, and we have an awareness problem with patients. So I, I look at Good Sleep Co. being able to help that a lot with also a lot of other, other forces are going to have to come into play. But very much like the pharmaceutical companies do here in the States, uh, they market to patients and then the patient has a conversation with their provider. So I'm hoping and trying to help Good Sleep Co. as they launch here in America to understand that that's what we need here. Um, right now, we're kind of quibbling over the same 20% that get diagnosed. And even at that, oral appliances are a very small percentage of that, 4 or 5%. Uh, so after people fail CPAP, essentially, we get 17% of the people in therapy. And they do get diagnosed. So we get 17% of the 20% of, of the patients in therapy. Um, and I think Good Sleep Co. sees this as an opportunity for them to help patients, which in turn will, I believe, help the dental sleep industry and the, specifically the oral plants industry uh, to offer what we can for patients uh, in a higher volume, which also will then bring, bring costs down. So I, I think the ADA has asked dentists to, to screen patients, and they haven't. That's different than a patient coming in and wanting your service. And that's what I'm hoping to, to uh, initiate here. And Good Sleep Co. is on board with me with that. It's just a matter of can we find our way through it. And I, I think it absolutely has to be done. I just think we need to find a way. And in my estimation, this is a good first step to try to accomplish that. Well, John, I know of at least three oral appliance companies that um, are going to soon have the ability to um, um, embed sensors in their devices that uh, provide remotely information about both compliance and um, effectiveness of, of, of the appliance in real time. Uh, how does Good Steepco fit into this equation? considering that those products are going to be available? First of all, I'm, I'm glad that those appliance manufacturers have gone down this path because we need to do something to get more on par with CPAP in the medical community's eyes because, in, you know, in reality, we need them helping us to help, if nothing else, the patients that fail PAP because right now nothing's being done for them. So I'm not so concerned about compliance recording or documentation with oral appliances. I, 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 others may think different of this, but in, in my mind, we don't know who takes a sleep test when we send a home sleep test home with them. We don't know who's wearing the CPAP. And, you know, certainly nobody's going to wear your fabricated oral appliance. 
you know, you it, it's custom made to fit you. So I think the the um, chips, although I'm not privileged to the information of what data that's going to provide, I'm assuming that it's going to be ODI and, and SPO2 values and then and then compliance. I, I think the industry is definitely headed towards um, ODI, hypoxic burden, uh, and away from AHI, although I'm not sure AHI will ever totally go away. Um, and even if tomorrow, if the data that we were gathering up in these uh, uh, new chips and these appliances is exactly what we need, that does not mean the payers are going to buy into that. So we're probably going to be living with AHI for, I don't know, a decade or more. I, I don't have any way of knowing that. So let me answer the question this way. First of all, I think what Good Sleep Co. brings to the table right now is that with the sleep image ring uh, on the front end, they can provide the data, not only the AHI, but also the SPO2 data. And they can provide that for whatever appliance the patient is wearing. So now we have the capability of one appliance manufacturer not being limited with respect to their market simply because they can't make the investment for these chips. And I, I do not know if these manufacturers are going to make those chips available to other, to other um, laboratories or not. But even if they do, an embedded chip is going to increase the cost of the appliance. And with the awareness problem we have, and the increase in costs combined with the decrease in the reimbursement, which is going to continue to be a trend. We simply need to find a way to deliver quality care in a less expensive, more efficient manner. Um, the Brabon chip, I think there were some problems with that. I'm certain that these are, are going to be much better than that, but they have battery lives. Um, I, I believe the FDA wouldn't let you put a new chip in an old appliance, so you had to remake the appliance. So it just escalated the cost of the whole thing. I believe the the good news here, at least through the two or three months that I've been working with Good Sleep Co., we've had some conversations that I brought to the table that I think on the front end, even though presently they're using the sleep image ring, they're going to have to be able to pivot and probably move more towards uh, oximetry, perhaps ODI, hypoxic burden. Um, you know, we have the AHRQ report, which certainly has stirred this industry up a little bit. So essentially, uh, bottom line, I think Good Sleep Co. offers a solution immediately to, it, it's already in place for appliances and all appliance manufacturers and all patients, even if they have an existing appliance. You can now come in and monitor that appliance, even if, if it was made two years ago. So I think there's great benefit to to both of these of these processes, the embedded appliances, and then what Good Sleep Co is doing now as well. I can see what you're saying. I mean, not all of the appliances are going to have a, a proprietary chip, so um, this process here can uh, be very beneficial for those appliances that don't have access to that chip. That's well, my hope. Yeah. Uh, listen, thank you very much for a very educational session, and uh, I look forward to meeting uh, either Greg or Joel, whichever one's going to be in at the North American Dental Sleep Medicine Symposium, or uh, I'll be in February. And, uh, and thank you all for participating. Much appreciated, and I'll say farewell to everyone. And did, do you have any last words, John? Uh, I just want to want to reinforce that Joel will be at the NADSM and Greg is planning on being at Jason Tierney's meeting in Arizona. And I want to thank you, John and STD Academy and and for helping me spread this information. And if anybody has any questions, you have my email address there. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to share any information with you that I can. So, John, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone.